Good morning. Would you please stand and join me in singing as our faculty and graduates enter the chapel? prayer as we begin the ceremony with the invocation. Please remain standing at the end of the prayer for our confession together of the Apostles' Creed. Let us pray. Our Father, we pray to you, the one true and living God, the triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Father, we come before you to confess that you are indeed immortal, invisible, the God only wise. You are in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes, except you have loved us to reveal yourself to us, to reveal yourself to us in the creation you have made, to reveal yourself to us in the scriptures you have given us, to reveal yourself to us in the incarnate word, the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we are saved. 
Father, we recognize this morning that what we are doing here in its structure is what is being repeated hundreds and hundreds of times across this country. But here, this is a service of Christian worship. This is indeed a commencement, and we feel the joy of it. This is a great and historic day in the lives of these graduates and of their families and of this school. But there is far more to what we are doing here. We dare to come and worship the worship of the true God. Father, thus we pray that even in this commencement service, especially in this commencement service, we will worship you in spirit and in truth, for we know you are seeking such worshipers to come before you. Father, we thank you for the gift of learning. We thank you for the investment of faculty. We thank you for the love of family. We thank you for the studiousness of students. We thank you for milestones such as this great milestone today. May this be to your glory yet one more step in that long faithfulness of obedience. May it be true for all of us present. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Christian church has confessed the one true faith together in many and various forms, but one of the most ancient comes in the form known to us as the Apostles' Creed. You find it in your program, and we will read it together in unison as together we will confess the faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This is Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, our pleasures forevermore. This is First Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Even I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. May we pray. Almighty God, in your word you have told us that you are the God of the nations. You are the King of kings and you are the Lord of lords. You promised from the very beginning of our history that all peoples would be blessed through your covenant and your chosen family. As we are gathered here today at this auspicious occasion, we recognize that you have not changed that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so your passion for the peoples of this world has also not changed. We know the ending of this incredible story, that people from every tribe and tongue and nation will stand before you wearing the righteousness of Christ and will worship you for all time. Our prayer here today is that you would anoint this graduating class that the passion that has been poured into them by this faculty, by this administration, by their local churches where they've been fed and have served others, that that passion would grow and would be contagious so that wherever they may go, they would not be able to get beyond your calling to go and reach all peoples. We pray that you would not allow this graduating class to rest. May they not be comforted, may they not be at peace with a simple, safe, America-infiltrated ministry. Whether they're serving in the classroom or serving in the boardroom or in a local church here in Kentucky, we pray that their very bones would be rattled to the core with the realization that your gospel message has yet to be brought to the world. Give them a passion to move beyond their own people, to get beyond the easy ministry of serving those who are like them whether that means walking across the street and meeting a family of a different culture, or it means getting more education to learn a language that is not their own, or it means giving up free time to serve those who have never had free time, or if it means selling all of their worldly possessions and moving halfway across the world to live amongst those who need to hear your word for the first time, wherever that may be, and God, You have a purpose and a plan for people in all of those walks of life. But wherever that may be, we pray this morning that these graduates, as they recess from this auditorium, that they would leave with a burning desire to see your kingdom come. We pray that for the graduates. We pray that for the faculty, for the administration. And most especially, we pray that for the parents who may have to make the biggest sacrifice of all, allowing their newly minted college college graduate son or daughter to go and serve. And we pray that you would give us all your passion for the world. In the name of the one who died, 
was buried and came out of the grave alive in order to redeem a people from all nations. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning. On behalf of the faculty, administration, trustees, and the family of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary Boyce College, it is my great joy to welcome you to this, the commencement of Boyce College. This is the day that the Lord has made. We already rejoice and are glad in it. Again, this is a recognizable shape and structure. These days, they graduate children from preschool. But this is not just getting dressed up and throwing a party. In fact, this is not merely a commencement. That word generally means beginning. It has come to mean also an end. But for the Christian church and for an institution that would serve Christ and his church and his gospel, this is really neither beginning nor end but deployment. And deployment to a next stage of faithfulness and a next step of obedience and as we are gathered here, one of, the, one of the themes of my heart, rather unexpectedly when I first came into this office, was how much love is represented by the gathering in this room. Love for these graduates as they are taking this momentous step today. Love for them long before they came to this place. And there are so many here in this room who love them even before they were born and have loved them unto now and will love them unto death, without whom these graduates would not be here. Augustine, that great church father, said that in terms of Christian education, there are three necessary loves. First of all, love of God, the most foundational of all loves. And then the love of learning. That also is a gift that God has given us that reflects his own character in terms of his own glory. God is glorified when his redeemed creatures learn. Learn most importantly about him. Learn the truths of his word. Learn in order to serve his church. The third requisite love is the love of those who are taught. And this morning, one of the great gifts we celebrate is the love that has been shown not only between parents and family and these graduates and that reciprocity, but also the love that has been shown by teacher to student, and the love that is returned from student to teacher. This too is something the world can only observe with some wonderment. We have no less wonderment, but we know this is one of God's gifts, a part of God's design. It is for His glory. All told with seminary and college commencements, this is for me now more than 80. One might think that doing this so many times, it will become somewhat routine and less meaningful. But I have to tell you from my heart, the longer I get to observe these graduations, the more graduates I get to see come across this stage and be deployed, the more moved I am, the more emotional the experience becomes. And that, by the way, is meant to be a validation. This is one of those events in which there is emotion that simply should also be received as a gift. Uh, there is a lot that is being celebrated here. There are unspeakable hopes that are invested here. There's great joy. It should not be otherwise. Our ceremony for Boyce College, this particular commencement is a bit different than uh, is our norm. And uh, thus, the dean and I are going to be making shorter comments than we might otherwise make. I realize that will be heartbreaking to all, <laughs> but I, at least in stating that, make something of a commitment that you will then measure to which we will be held. I want to refer you to the book of Proverbs, the first several verses of chapter 3. The longer I am in this role, perhaps it's inevitable, but the more paternal I feel. Maybe it's because I have seen my own son and daughter graduate from college. Maybe it's just because I'm getting old. Those gathered in this room, the students feel very old. 
and they are in the span of their own lives. They have no idea how old they make the rest of us feel. <laughs> Perhaps feeling parental is uh, not out of place. Solomon writing to his own son, this inspired wisdom that comes to us in the book of Proverbs. We turn to chapter 3. We'll read together the first 12 verses as I read aloud. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and the years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Here you have Solomon's divinely inspired wisdom to his son. Here you have the man who prayed that above all he would be given wisdom and what he covets for his own son is wisdom. There's been so much learning that is represented in the degrees to be presented today. The baccalaureate degree is now universally recognized as the most significant foundational degree of higher education. It's a very significant program. Four years of full-time study distilled into hours in the classroom and study outside the classroom, reading and conversation, lectures and paper writing and research and test taking and all that goes with the formal academic process. What's perhaps most frightening in the midst of all of that is that an education of optimal quality could be endured or received without any wisdom. The distinction between knowledge and wisdom found within this text is one that I think upon reflection is probably more particularly and peculiarly Christian than most of us perhaps pause to understand. We are called to wisdom. We are to aspire to wisdom. Wisdom does require knowledge. So there's absolutely no embarrassment in knowledge, nor is there any shortage of exhortations in the Bible that we should gain knowledge, the, nor is there any lack of honor to those who teach. The responsibility of knowledge, the stewardship of knowledge is a constant biblical theme. How then could there be anything higher in terms of, of our thought life, of our intellectual life? There could be only one thing higher, and that's wisdom. And the wisdom theology of the Scripture grounds all true wisdom in that which is absolutely consistent with God's own revelation, God's own character, God's own being. Wisdom is the gift to His creatures that they might know beyond knowledge. Most importantly, that they may know Him. Know His Word. Know His ways. Know His will. My exhortation to the graduates of the Boys College class of 2017 is to seize the knowledge that has been invested in you that you have worked so hard to attain. I also want to give you a frightening word. It is a transient reality. There are things you know now you will not know later. There are matters you have committed to memory sometimes in the dark desperation of the mid-morning hours <laughs> that you do not remember even now. <laughs> Frankly, it is only now that some of you recognize that when people told you in high school that one day this knowledge would be useful, by now you have figured out there is no context in which you can imagine it will be useful. <laughs> Wisdom is important, it's foundational, it's first, it is transient. But wisdom 
endures forever. And it is wisdom, we pray, you will take with you even more than knowledge. It is the applied wisdom of living in obedience to Christ and by God's word that we pray will mark your lives. It is the wisdom that will lead you to places you otherwise would not go for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is wisdom that will lead you to live in ways others would not live because of the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's word. It is for wisdom that you will live in a different way so that the world observing you will know that it is not by your wisdom that you live, but rather the wisdom that could come only from the one true and living God. The words of this proverb are so striking. They are also kind even as they are fatherly. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Just in case we did not fully understand what he meant, the next sentence. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So here, upon the authority of God's word, I leave you with an exhortation that I mean to reach your flesh and your bones. Lean not into your own wisdom. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. At times, we know there are certainly more words we could say. But I really need not say more words than to repeat what Solomon has given his own son in this proverb. This is our prayer for you. Around this room right now are so many who are praying for you even as this service continues. There are people who would want to be here who could not be present. There are those who have loved you, those who have invested in you, those who would have hope in this day who died without ever coming to see this day. And from this point onward in your life, I assure you, you will look back to this day. Look back from the vantage point of having leaned not into your own understanding but rather acknowledging him in all your ways. This is our prayer for you, the graduating class of Boyce College in 2017. This is a ceremony of commencement. It's really about deployment, and it's really not about you. It's all about the glory of God and our hopes for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen.
Well, here we are. My heart is so full of joy, class of 2017, joy in your uh, achievement and pride at all you've accomplished. I want to speak to you from my heart on the topic of fear. Now, that may have something to do with the fact that I find myself sandwiched between Drs. Moeller and Piper. <laughs> that may be more personal and existential than you realize. But I am convinced that fear is a powerful force. It's a powerful force. In fact, marketers are well aware of this, and they appear quite willing to capitalize upon it. I recently read about a new product, the Owlet Smart Sock. Have you heard of it? Well, let me help you. From the advertisement, peace of mind in parenting is closer than you think. The Smart Sock 2 uses pulse oximetry to measure your infant's heart rate and oxygen's level while they sleep. This information is communicated to your phone via a base station that is designed to notify you with lights and sounds if something doesn't appear just right with your baby. Using our app, you can view your baby's heart rate and oxygen levels in real time. Well, since the Smart Sock debuted in 2015, the, mar the uh, manufacturer has sold some 80,000 units, priced around $300 each. And it's all tagged with the catchphrase, worry less, sleep better. And of course, there's no question that for many families, these kinds of technolo technological advancements represent a valuable help in caring for children with precarious health concerns. We should rejoice in that. But it is worth noting that the manufacturer is positioning this as a product for all parents, for all children. And the insinuation is clear. What kind of parent would not want to know their infant's heart rate and oxygen levels at any given moment? How cruel and cold-hearted might you be? And you might as well let your children be raised by wolves. Next thing you know it, you're forking over $300 and a sock is in the, in the way to your mailbox. Well, amid all the joy and celebration of a day such as this, we might also admit that there is a measure of fear mixed in. And perhaps it is better described as an awareness of the vast uncertainties of your future. We feel it as your faculty. We have poured so much into you. We have come to know and to love you. And yet we recognize that you now leave and you must go your own way. And there is uncertainty in that for us. Will you run the race well? Will you finish well? Parents surely feel it. Graduating from college is a significant achievement, and the conclusion of tuition payments is reason enough to slay the fatted calf. <laughs> and I didn't even get an amen on that. But parents certainly bear the burden of wondering, what kind of career will you undertake? Will you, students, secure gainful employment? Who will you marry? Where will you live? Will you one day sire grandchildren? And when you do, will you ever come to visit? And parents, I did check, by the way, there is no smart sock option for your son or daughter to be fitted with when they receive their diploma. And students, I suspect you feel it yourselves. Even as you celebrate, there are so many unknowns about your path ahead. And at your most honest moment, you might even sense a bit of fear as you consider these unknowns. While your future path may seem unclear or uncertain to you, it is no mystery to the ruler of the universe. Your soon-to-be alma mater has high hopes for you. You have arrived at a great milestone and an achievement and are indeed to be commended. But don't trust in yourself. As you now step forward in God's calling in this next season of life, your confidence cannot ultimately be in your own abilities or skills, as exceptional as they are. You are, after all, a finite creature with finite abilities. And at some point, you will find yourself despairing and disappointed. You will feel inadequate. You will sense your own frailty and weakness. And life will bring for you, as it does for all of God's children, seasons of suffering. In fact, this is precisely what Jesus tells us in John 16. After explaining to his disciples what would happen upon his return to the Father, he says, 
I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. At some point, troubles will find you. The life you envision for yourself will take a different shape. People will disappoint you and even hurt you. Family members will suffer and it will break your heart. And if you stand for Jesus and his kingdom, you will face all sorts of opposition. As Christ said, you will have suffering in this world. But the ruling king assures us, even commands us this morning, be courageous. And while commencement ceremonies across this country will echo the call to courage and hope, most of them will establish it upon ground that cannot hold. They will say, class of 2017, look to yourself. Take note of how remarkable, how exceptional, how extraordinary you are. Consider all the potential that rests within you. But at some point, the bottom on that ideology inevitably falls out. Boyce College graduates, be courageous. But may your courage be based upon the finished work of Christ. He has indeed conquered the world, and as you know, go, now go out, as soldiers of Christ in truth arrayed, we send and commission you with our love, our hopes, and our prayers. Your abilities truly are remarkable, and your achievement significant. Your calling is high, and your future uncertain. But be strong and courageous in the Lord. Only he is sufficient to lead you and sustain you. God bless you. Pray together. Father, we know that none of us is here because of our own doing. We know that it is by your doing that we are in Christ Jesus. We are your children because you have mercifully called us forth. And because of your great love for us, you have joined us to a great cloud of witnesses, a congregation of the redeemed from every age and place. And we are your church, your people, your body. And that is why we pray, Father, for we know that we are not now what we will be. In this room, we represent congregations of your people from around the country and around the world. Father, I pray that you would empower us to be what you have called us to be, to be in the world, not of the world for the sake of the world. Help us, Father, to be more and more now what we will be at the last day, arrayed in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that we might be holy and without blemish. And Father, we lift up now our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering for the sake of the gospel that we all confess. We pray that you would break the teeth of the wicked who oppress them and that you would deliver them from evil. And until you do, we pray that you would give them great courage and endurance and that the spirit of glory and of God would rest on them. Father, for all of us, we pray that you would so array the powers above us that we might have a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. For we know that this is good and pleasing in your sight. And upon our confession of Christ, crucified and raised for sinners, Father, build your church, and may the gates of hell never prevail against us. Father, we confess that we are just as dependent upon your grace today as the day we first tasted it. So we ask for your help now in the name of our great King Jesus. Amen. On an occasion like this, there are a few natural things you do. It seems uh, not only natural, but requisite that we say something. And in particular, that something very important be said. There is no one who is more appropriate to speak as the commencement speaker for the Boyce College class of 2017 than Dr. John Piper. 
And I, with you, am looking forward to hearing him as he speaks from his heart to the graduating class of Boyce College of 2017 and to his own daughter's heart, Talitha, who is a member of this graduating class. As this opportunity came, I knew that my great hope was that John Piper would speak on this occasion. From the very first time I knew of him until now, I have been learning from this pastor and teacher and writer. I'm so thankful he's become a close friend, and I can say that that has just made me love him all the more. He's superbly equipped to speak at a commencement for an academic institution, a graduate of Wheaton College and Fuller Theological Seminary. He did his doctoral degree in New Testament studies at the University of Munich. He taught for a time on the faculty of Bethel College. Then, of course, you know him best because of 33 years spent as pastor of the Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is also the founder of the Bethlehem College and Theological Seminary. I dare say most in this room probably know him most directly through his writings and through his preaching, his teaching. The Lord has used him mightily over the course of the last several decades to call us all to a greater faithfulness and a greater joy in Christ and in the gospel unto the nations. So today we welcome one not, who under any circumstance was, is and always will be so welcome in this pulpit. We welcome someone from whom we have already learned so much. We welcome John and Noel as they are here today primarily as parents, celebrating as Christian parents do. But we are welcoming now Dr. John Piper to give the commencement address for the Boyce College graduating class of 2017. We want to hear from John the preacher, John the scholar, John the theologian, John the missiologist, John the author. This morning, John the father. Please join me as we wait to listen for the commencement address for 2017. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help now for these few minutes to be useful, to build up the faith of everyone here and to glorify your name and to help these students understand who they are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What I want to do is uh, make plain to the graduates, but really to everybody here, that if you're a Christian, you're going to live the rest of your life on the earth, however short or long, in a condition which I'm going to call sacred schizophrenia. My dictionary, after the medical and tragic definition, has this definition of schizophrenia, a state characterized by coexistence of contradictory or incompatible elements. That's what I mean by schizophrenia in this talk. I call it sacred because it is brought about by the Holy Spirit. It's not a perfect state, but it's a good state, a temporary state, it is a sacred schizophrenia. Or to put it another way, all of you who are Christians will live the rest of your lives on the earth as two selves. And I want to clarify from the words of Jesus who the two selves are, which one of them is your true self, and then two major flashpoints of conflict between the two selves that Jesus says you will battle for the rest of your life on the earth. And now the reason I'm saying the rest of your life on the earth is because after you die, you won't have this condition anymore. Or if Jesus comes back first, you won't 
have this condition anymore. There will be no longer two selves. You will not have sacred schizophrenia. You will be one unified self, and all conflict will be over. Until that day, it is absolutely imperative that you know the condition you're in, which I'm calling sacred schizophrenia. You need to know who your two selves are. You need to know which one of them is the true self, and you need to know what Jesus says are at least two of the major flashpoints of conflict that you will fight. So the text I have in mind, I'm not assuming that you have Bibles under your coat, your cloak, your robe, so listen carefully to Mark 8, 34 to 38. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save himself will lose it, saves his life will lose it, Whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels. So that's my text, verse 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a denier of self. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. If you are denying yourself, there is a you that is being denied and a you that is denying. Which means to be a follower of Jesus is to have sacred schizophrenia. A self that must be denied and a self that does the denying. You with me? Seems pretty plain to me. What's the difference between these two selves? Jesus explains that the reason this one self needs to be denied is because you're called to take up a cross. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And as you know, a cross is an instrument of torture and death. To take up your cross willingly and intentionally is to choose a path with Jesus of opposition, shame, suffering, death. That's what happens when you take up your cross. And Jesus is saying, in order to do that, you must deny yourself. Why? Because in every one of you, there is a self who will not take up a cross, hates opposition, shame, suffering, death, says to that option, no way am I going to endure that. And when you hear yourself say, I don't want opposition, I want approval. I don't want shame, I want honor. I don't want suffering, I want comfort and pleasure in this world right now, and I don't want to die. I want to be safe, and I want to be secure, and I want to stay alive. When you hear yourself say that, you must say, no, you're not in charge anymore. You're not who I am. Your days are numbered. 
And so you may keep your mouth shut. You will not hold sway in this affair. That's what you must do. You have a holy schizophrenia. So when you rise up, you rise up and say to you, no, who's talking? Where did that come from? Where did this you that treasures Jesus so much that a cross is worth it? Opposition, shame, suffering, death is worth it? Where did that come from? It came from the new birth. Nicodemus, you must be born again, or you won't ever see the kingdom of God. You won't ever see me for who I am in my infinite value and infinite beauty. You won't ever see me that way until you're born again by the Holy Spirit. That's where it came from. You, you're a new creation. You came into being, you weren't born this way. You weren't born ready to take up a cross because of how satisfying Jesus is. This is new. It is the true you if you have the condition of sacred schizophrenia. Verse 35. Sometimes I hear people describe the Christian teaching on self-denial as though the denied self is the real lover of life, the one who's really committed to joy and pleasure, while the denying self is morose, has a death wish, cares across around like a bludgeon against joy. If you're inclined to think that way, you need to read verse 35. It goes like this. Because whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. What motive is Jesus appealing to? Listen. Whoever would save his life here in this world by cross avoiding will lose it. And you don't want to lose it, do you? No, I don't want to lose it. And you shouldn't want to lose it. So don't lose it. That's the motive. Clear as day. Don't lose your life. Whatever it costs, don't lose it. Love life. Or he goes on, whoever would save his life here in this world by avoiding the cross will lose it. Whoever loses his life, now we're on the second part, whoever loses his life by treasuring me so much that you're willing to take a cross, whoever loses his life will save it. And you don't want to lose your life. You want to save it, so save it. Isn't that the motive? He's pleading with you. Save your life, graduates. Save your life. Don't throw away your life. That's the way Jesus is arguing. Who's the real lover of life here? Who's got the death wish here? It isn't Jesus who's got the death wish here for you. Don't throw away your life. Follow me, he says. My whole argument in having you deny the old self is that he's a liar. He's a fool. 
he thinks that 80 years of human approval and the pleasures of this world are better than 80 millions of years of undiminished, unparalleled joy in the presence of God. He's a fool. Are you going to listen to him? Are you going to let this old self be you? What an idiot he is. And Jesus is pleading with you, don't die with him. Live with me. I said there were two flashpoints between this old self and new self. One of the flashpoints comes in verses 36 and 37, and one of the flashpoints comes in verse 38 and will be done. Here's verse 36 and 37. It's an argument for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the flashpoint of I want the world. I want to gain. I'm going to have more stuff. That's my life. Every one of you has a self, Jesus is making plain, who will tell you till the day you die, and I'm a 71-year-old warrior with this self, and he is as real today in so-called post-professional life, more real, more real because the whole world is telling 70 year olds to play and get more stuff and enjoy stuff and that's life there's a 20 year old version of your idiot self and there's a 70 year old version of your idiot self and you will need to make war on this self till you are no longer two, but one glorious self. And he's going to say to you this old self, come on, if we can just accumulate more of this world, more possessions, more protections, more insurance policies, more symbols of power, more possibilities of bodily pleasure, then we will have life, we will save our lives. He's a liar. You won't save your life that way. You will lose it even if you gain the whole world. In the next 60 years, for some of you, it will be less, a few more. But in the next 60 years of your life, there will scarcely be a day when you don't receive the message from the world, having things is having life. And Jesus says, no. Having things is not life. Having me is life. Will you believe the self that loves the message? Things, things, things. That's flashpoint number one. The power of possessions. And Jesus says, you're going to fight this or not. Flashpoint number two is in verse 38. It probably is more powerful. I think it is. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Son of Man appears, the glory of the creator of the universe, the Father, 
millions of unfallen angels. He's coming. What's the flashpoint here? The first one was the power of possessions. This one is the power of approval and praise. You know what's so shocking here? Is that the self in us that craves approval from people is pictured in this text, this verse 38, as loving the approval of loving the approval of adulterers and sinners. What does being ashamed mean? You're ashamed of somebody. It means I don't want to look like a foolish Christian when all the adulterers and sinners are so cool. Don't want to look like a fool. And I'll tell you, that old self will do almost anything, make almost any compromise to keep from looking like an idiot to the world of adulterers and sinners. That's insane. Is there an alternative audience that you might want approval from? Only the Son of Man and the glory of the Father and the holy angels when they come. That's all. That will be the audience on one side. The perishing world, sinners will be the audience on the other side. And one of yourselves loves the smile of the world and one of yourselves loves the smile of Jesus. Those are the two flashpoints that Jesus said you will deal with till you're dead. Human possessions and human praise. And how you respond depends on whether you're in the condition of sacred schizophrenia. Might be helpful to end with a kind of warning and hope from the life of the namesake of this college James Pettigrew Boyce. He was born in Charleston, South Carolina, on my birthday, but 1827. <laughs> he attended Charleston College and then Brown University and then Princeton Seminary. While he was at Charleston, Charlotte, <laughs> Charleston College, he, he was not yet a believer. He, he was not yet in the condition of sacred schizophrenia. He was more of a prankster and a playboy. And one day, for whatever reason, President Brantley of the college saw him hiding behind a tree and said these words, there is Boyce who will be a great man if he does not become a devil. That's true for every one in this room. Those are the only two options in front of you. Yes, they are. You are all destined to be unspeakably great in eternity or a devil in eternity. Whether you become a devil or great depends on whether you are in the state of sacred schizophrenia. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have sacred schizophrenia. It is painful, it is glorious, and it is temporary. There is a self that must be denied and a self that denies. 
the denied self desperately seeks life from the pleasures, possessions, praises of man, and therefore says no to the cross. The denying self loves real life that lasts forever, loves Jesus as all-satisfying, loves meaning more than money, loves the praise of holy heaven more than the praise of sinful earth. The denying self is the true you. Do you hear me? The denying self is the true you if you have this condition. That you will live forever. Don't begrudge a few decades of sacred schizophrenia. It will be over soon enough. And there will be one self someday, one unified, true self. And all self-denial, just picture this, all self-denial will be over. All of it will be over. Do you hear what that means? Everything you will ever want, you will have. Everything that God can be for you in Jesus. Father, help us to own our temporary, painful, embattled, sacred schizophrenia and make these students successful in this warfare, I pray in Jesus' name. Please stand, we respond by singing a hymn that will encourage us to delight in Christ alone.
We now come to that time when we'll observe the conferring of degrees and the presentation of diplomas. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary was established in 1859, and thus so was the beginning of Boyce College. This institution was established for the purpose of educating, training, and preparing ministers for service in the churches. From the very beginning, this school was established for the church, for the nations, and for the glory of God. Without any hesitation or embarrassment, we stand upon the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We stand upon the full authority, truthfulness, and inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. We stand together for the good news of the gospel of Christ to be preached in order that sinners may hear the gospel, and hearing they may believe, and believing they will be saved. This institution exists so that the church will have godly and educated ministers and faithful and effective servants, a rightly ordered message and mission, and such that the graduates of Boyce College, trained in various arenas of learning, will go out into the ends of the earth, faithful in every calling. To that end, we represent the very highest hallmarks of academic excellence. This is recognized by every related accrediting agency in the nation. Those who teach on this faculty are known as leading scholars in their fields, as excellent teachers in the classroom, and as those who gladly serve by their calling the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boyce College is a confessional school. Every faculty member agrees to teach in accordance with and not contrary to our abstract principles in the Baptist faith and message. We are bound by sacred commitment to these truths as taught in the Holy Scriptures, and we gladly teach within this common and shared commitment. From our churches, we have received a sacred trust, and to the world, we have made a solemn pledge to these graduates. We now present these degrees and diplomas. The vision for Southern Seminary reaches back to 1859, but our mission touches every continent on the globe. Today, graduates will receive degrees from Boyce College, the undergraduate school of the seminary. Next week, graduates will receive degrees from the two graduate schools, the School of Theology and the Billy Graham School of Missions, Evangelism, and Ministry. This is a service of Christian worship. Each of us is ready to congratulate these graduates on their accomplishment, but we ask that everyone respect this service of worship and withhold applause and gestures of con congratulation until all of the graduates in each degree program have received their diplomas. I now introduce the Dean of Boyce College, Dr. Matthew J. Hall, who will present the graduates for, for the certificates, the associate degree, and the baccalaureate degrees. Also joining us on the platform is Mrs. Mary Moeller, the director of the Seminary Wives Institute. The Certificate in Ministry Studies from the Seminary Wives Institute is a program of study through Boyce College that is designed for the wives of ministers at Southern Seminary. The required courses and electives include both biblically based and practically applied units. Students must satisfactorily complete 13 units of study. The candidates for the Certificate in Ministry Studies are now coming forward. President Muller, these candidates have satisfactorily fulfilled all the requirements of their program of study. I am pleased to present these candidates for the conferring of their certificates and the awarding of their diplomas. By the authority of the trustees vested in the faculty of Boyce College and in the name of the faculty, I do hereby confer upon you each the certificate in ministry studies with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Lauren Ashley Cole. Lauren, congratulations. Paola Damicella. Controtti. Alina Ma'am Thomas. NT One. The Advanced Certificate in Ministry Studies goes a step beyond 
by requiring a minimum of 17 units of study. This program usually takes four years to complete and allows the students to take seven electives instead of the three required for the basic certificate. The candidates for the advanced certificate in ministry studies are now coming forward. President Moeller, these candidates have satisfactorily fulfilled all of the requirements of their program of study. I am pleased to present these candidates for the conferring of their certificates and the awarding of their diplomas. By the authority of the trustees vested in the faculty of Boyce College and in the name of the faculty, I do hereby confer upon each of you the advanced certificate in ministry studies with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Jessica Lee Crawford. Kristen Leanne Ellis. Dandy Lee Hussey. Megan L. Pickard. Laura Gwendolyn Potit. Anastasia Lynn Settle. Nancy Louise Stevens. The Certificate in Worldview Studies is an intensive 35 credit hour program designed to be completed in one academic year and is intended to help establish a foundation and a biblical worldview for first time students preparing for further studies in the university. The candidates for the Certificate in Worldview Studies are now coming forward. President Moeller, these candidates have satisfactorily fulfilled all the requirements of their program of study. I am pleased to present these candidates for the conferring of their certificates and the awarding of their diplomas. By the authority of the trustees vested in the faculty of Boyce College and in the name of the faculty, I do hereby confer upon each of you the certificate in worldview studies with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Aidan Gary Alba. Dustin Scott Dane. Ramon Alberto de Lara. Daniel Adam Goodman. Leah Nicole Heisch. Hannah Therese Colt. Derek Jordan Legowski. Esther Rose Prislovsky. The Associate of Arts is a two-year degree that offers a balanced curriculum of 60 hours, including studies in Bible, theology, church history, practical ministry, and general education. The program is designed to equip persons for service in a variety of ministry settings. The program also offers a foundation for those who later wish to complete a baccalaureate degree. The candidates for the Associate of Arts have come forward. President Moeller, these candidates have satisfactorily fulfilled all the requirements of their program of study, and I am pleased to present these candidates for the conferring of their degrees and the awarding of their diplomas. By the authority of the trustees vested in the faculty of Boyce College and in the name of the faculty, I do hereby confer upon each of you the Associate of Arts with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Samuel G. Crabtree. Janessa Joy Hendricks. Shauna 
F. Komatsu. Macy Selena Lloyd. William David Wendelgast. Molly Elizabeth Weidman. The Bachelor of Science degree is designed for preparation in the practice of ministry within the churches and denomination. With a minimum of 120 hours, the four-year degree includes majors and minors in business administration, church ministry, biblical counseling, education, global studies, music and worship, youth ministry, and humanities. The candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree are now coming forward. President Moeller, these candidates have satisfactorily fulfilled all the requirements of their program of study. I am pleased to present these candidates for the conferring of their degrees and the awarding of their diplomas. By the authority of the trustees vested in the faculty of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and in the name of the faculty, I do hereby confer upon each of you the Bachelor of Science with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Ellen Nicole Aiken. Jessica Lillian Anderson. Megan Brooke Ard. Joshua Caleb Arthur. Jonathan Brantley Beck. Caitlin Mignon Bernardi. Ryan David Bernardi. Rachel Hannah Borengasser. Emily Nicole Brown. Valerie Faye Buzinitz. Leslie Allison Barnett. Daniel David Carmichael. Matthew Leon Carpenter. Madalena M. Carucci. Robert Ellis Chapman. Laura Elena Cook. Hudson K. Corrington. Brian Bradley Cox. Drew Allen Crawley. Alexander Keithley Darnell. Brittany Jill Doolittle. Jonathan R. Drury. Haley Owen Etheridge. Brock Warren Felur. Allison Irene Fletcher. Kurt Cameron Frank. David Edward Froman. Jennifer Ann Garner. Nicole Barbara Gile. Rebecca Ann Goodman. Brian Austin Green. Kyle William Gross. Caroline Irene Haley. Nikki Ann Holstein. Amber Elizabeth Holt. Mark Benjamin Hughes. Ruth Ann Irvin. Mackenzie Faith Coughlin. 
Michael Robert Keenan. Daniel H. Colis. Janae Jana Leek. Hannah Rebecca Lindsay. Tadangrelia Lankumer. Sean Michael Lopes. Susan Michelle Mead. Zach Enward Menzer. Annalise Lauren Mezeboff. Tanner V. Milliken. Carrie Elizabeth Mulvey. Jonathan Lee Newlin. <laughs> Rebecca May Nicholas. Kaylee Meredith Ferris. Talitha Ruth Piper. Jessica Danielle Pochek. Tanner Isaac Rosenbaum. Peter Paul Scurfari. Ashley Rose Sherwood. Caleb Andrew David Sherwood. Seth Simmons Singleton. Hannah J. Snyder. Kyle James Stansbury. Kareen Alexis Stark. Matthew David Stern. Trey Ryan Stewart. Brian Lloyd Straub. Sarah Faith Taylor. Ashley Jean Triplett. Jessica Chanley Vaughn. Mary Kate Wright. Insung Yi. Samuel A. Young. Dalton Michael Zebrick. The Bachelor of Arts degree is designed for students called to pastoral or other ministry settings. With a minimum of 129 hours, the four-year degree includes majors and minors in biblical and theological studies, Christian worldview and apologetics, and expository preaching and pastoral leadership. In each of these programs, a, a thorough study of scripture is provided, including biblical languages, theological disciplines, and practical training. The candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degree are now coming forward. President Moeller, these candidates have satisfactorily fulfilled all the requirements of their program of study, and I am pleased to present these candidates for the conferring of their degrees and the awarding of their diplomas. By the authority of the trustees vested in the faculty of Boyce College and in the name of the faculty, I do hereby confer upon each of you the Bachelor of Arts with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Bryce. Vincent Alba. Mary Elizabeth Arbogast. Garrett Mason Davis. Ethan Scott DeWitt. Caitlin Grace 
Glick. Ethan Andrew Graves. Wesley Robert Hartgrove. Jonathan Wesley Hunter. Derek Scott Keener. Ramon James Lago. Priscilla Ruth Liao. Jared Elias Mayhorn. John M. McKenzie. Andrew Joseph Mee. Mackenzie Lane Miller. Caleb Anthony Neal. Nathaniel David O'Brien. Nicole Marie Peters. Samuel James Stark. Matthew Samuel Swanberg. Dalton Wayne Neal Teal. James Peter Tipton. Jonathan Richard Wright. Joseph Lee Yu. Ladies and gentlemen and all those here gathered, would you please join with me in welcoming the Boyce College graduating class of the year of our Lord 2017. None of these graduates arrives alone. There are those who, as we've already said, have loved these graduates even before they were born and have loved them until now, sustaining them until this day. We want to recognize several of special guests who are amongst those celebrating this commencement with us. If you are the parent of one of these graduates, would you just please stand that we might recognize you? If you're the grandparent of one of these graduates, would you please stand that we might recognize you? If you are the proud or honestly surprised sibling of one of these graduates, would you please stand that we might welcome you? It is true of so many of our graduates that they leave with far more than they came. 
If you are the spouse of one of these graduates, would you please stand that we might recognize you this morning? There are those who are here because they are the pastors of those amongst the graduates today. If you are the pastor of one of these graduates, if not standing in as a pastor for those who are the pastors of these graduates and have channeled their lives into these graduates, would you please stand that we might recognize you this morning. And finally, as a sign of God's promise for the future, if you are the child of one of these graduates, would you please stand or be lifted up? I didn't plan to do this, but I'm going to do this. I have no permission to do this, but I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to try to do this. You see a little girl right here on the front who's the daughter of one of our graduates, Seth Singleton. She was born just days ago, and they were told that she would not live. There was a funeral service scheduled days ago for this little girl. Brothers and sisters of the glory of God, there was no funeral. She is at her father's graduation. Who but the Lord would do this? Amen. Amen. I now invite the graduating class of 2017 to stand with me to read together the graduation pledge, the next in line. As graduates of Boyce College, we hereby declare to the watching world that we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who are called to ministry and service by the power of the Holy Spirit. By grace we have been saved, and by grace we have been called into the service of our Lord and of his Christ. On this day of graduation and commencement, with gladness we join that long line of faithful servants who have gone before us. With gratitude we have received the privilege of theological education. We are now stewards of a priceless inheritance and servants of a church that has been fed by generations of pastors and shepherds, planted by missionaries, served by those who labored in obscurity, and watered by the blood of martyrs. We now take up our charge and eagerly take our place. We stand on the truth of God's word, on the power of the gospel, and on the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We will minister in fidelity and in the purity of the gospel, letting no harm come to the church by our hands, no injury by our tongues, and no hindrance to the kingdom by our lives. We are unashamed of the gospel, determined to serve wherever God may call us, knowing that by the power of the resurrected Christ, our labor is not in vain. We are heralds of the good news, stewards of the mysteries of God, and torchbearers to the nations. We are soldiers of Christ arrayed in truth, and we commit the length of our days to the service of our Savior. We are graduates of Boyce College. By God's grace, we are the next in line. Now, as the graduates are seated for just a moment, I want to speak to the congregation 
just to remind you of why we have been gathered here. Yes, it was a commencement service and we had the display of all that is to be recognized in the conferring of degrees and the awarding of diplomas. But language has been used here in the charges, in the, the pledge, in the scriptures, in the message that we simply want to explain as this service comes to an end. The greatest hope of these graduates is not just that you would find pride in them. The greatest hope of these graduates is that if there be anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, that you would. We want you to know that when we talk about the gospel, we speak about that message of that infinite hope that is given to us eternally in Christ. We speak of that which is revealed in Scripture. We want you to know what it means for sinners to be saved through the atonement accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we mean by that? We mean by that that we know that every single one of us is a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that none of us can rescue ourselves from this predicament. There is no way we can earn the righteousness alone that will save. The penalty of our sin rightly falls upon us and so also the wrath of God. But that cherished Bible verse you probably already know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. That's the summary of the gospel. What we could not do for ourselves, God did for us in Christ. Sending his own son, incarnate in human flesh, taking on form just such as we, who lived a sinless life and who went to the cross and died on the cross, shedding his blood, paying in full the penalty for our sin. And on the third day, the Father raised him from the dead. And thus, salvation is promised to all those who as sinners confess their sins and know their need of a Savior and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe. The greatest hope of these graduates is that there would be anyone here or within the sound of my voice who does not yet know Christ who perhaps even because of this ceremony together would hear the gospel and believe and believing be saved. We are getting ready to send this class out to the ends of the earth in their deployment. As the pledge reminds us, these are graduates. More than that, they are soldiers of Christ arrayed in truth. Would you please stand together as we sing the seminary hymn written in 1860 for the seminary's first commencement, Soldiers of Truth in Christ Array. Please remain standing at the end of the hymn for our benediction and remain in place for the recessional. Thank you.
Almighty God, giver of all good things, who by thy Holy Spirit hast appointed diverse callings of ministers in thy church, mercifully behold these thy servants now called to the fields of ministry, and so replenish them with the truth of thy doctrine and adorn them with innocency of life, that both by word and good example they may faithfully serve thee in this calling to the glory of thy name and the edification of thy church through the merits of our Savior Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the same Holy Spirit, world without end. Amen and amen.